Um, first of all, inshallah, I welcome my uh, um, uh, guest speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Muzam al Siddiqui. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with you, and, and you deserve more than what we have here in the uh, in mass. But definitely, Dr. Muzam is one of the leaders not only in uh, California but in the United States. We have Imam Jihad Safir who is not yet here. And if you join us, inshallah, later, uh, Brother uh, Dr. Hisham Abdullah as well among us, uh, Brother Hussam Ailouz, Sister Ajara Bada, uh, Dr. Maryam Sada, and Yasmin Azam. And I want to ask, please, warm welcome to the, uh, our guest speakers today, inshallah. And inshallah, to make the introduction very quick, I want to uh, ask each one of the, uh, our guests, inshallah, to introduce yourself and uh, to highlight the best contribution uh, you do uh, for our community. Then inshallah, we'll start with the, uh, with the talk show, let's call it. So that's how Dr. Muzdam al Siddiqui uh, and go to the right. And in the same time, after you introduce yourself, you probably you wanna take one minute and, or two minutes to highlight your take in this subject. The, uh, you know, we're talking today about the uh, state of the Muslim Ummah. Probably wanna start the, the talk show by, what do you think about the state of the Muslim Ummah? They will come start the questions. That was Dr. Muzdam al Siddiqui. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. First of all, I want to thank our dear brother, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, he is uh, one of the executive members of the Shura Council of Southern California. I am the chairman of the Islamic Shura Council. And this Shura Council is, represents uh, the Masajid, the Islamic organization in Southern California. Uh, Shura Council has been in existence for more than 20 years. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, it's open to all the Masajid, to all the Islamic organizations that fulfill its uh, requirement, basic requirement that they must be registered, and they must have their bylaws. So any organization want to join, they are in Southern California, we welcome you. Uh, Alhamdulillah, at this time, we have more than 70 Islamic organizations that are members of the Shura Council. Uh, the Shura Council uh, is the Council of Consultation, Coordination, and Cooperation. That's what we would like to see, that Muslims consult with each other. Muslims come together, that is, and Muslims cooperate with each other. So this is the objective. And so we work together, alhamdulillah. Then also we try to have our engagement with interfaith groups. Jewish organization, Christian organization, Buddhist organization, other organizations that are here in this area. We work with them, we coordinate with them. We have engagement with civic groups. And alhamdulillah, and society is still known. We have interfaith program, interfaith iftar in the month of Ramadan. We also have open mosque day. That is something that we started here, alhamdulillah, in Southern California. And now it has become almost national, actually even international. <laughs> in Australia, they also had open mosque day. So alhamdulillah, this is a great thing. That is opening to our neighbors, come to our, our masajid and see what we do. Because a lot of people don't know who we are, what we do. So open mosque day is done once a, week, once a year. And uh, it is uh, a wonderful thing. A lot of maybe people appreciate that. So, Alhamdulillah. And this is important that people try, our, we should try to invite your neighbors to your own homes and uh, to your own mosques and let them know who we are. That's what we do. There are two important programs that uh, Shura Council is doing. One is the prison outreach program where we try to reach to prisoners who are Muslims and those who are interested to about Islam, about their rights and also whatever supplies, whatever things they need for their religious activities. We help them, we have an office there in the Shura Council, especially for that purpose. There is another thing that Alhamdulillah Shura Council is doing, it's a Muslim Speakers Network. Muslim Speakers Network is to prepare the young people, Americans, to come to go to various schools. There are thousands of schools and where they, they want to know about, inter, about various faiths, about various cultures. So uh, Shura Council informed them about Muslims of America. Just the information, 
give them some information. So that purpose, alhamdulillah, we train youth, men and women, to come and learn about that and then also to go and speak there. So these are the activities, alhamdulillah, we are doing. We have an office and our dear brother Shakil Sayyid, sitting on the other side, served as the executive director of the Shura Council for many years. And now we have brother Malik Bendelhum, who is our deputy uh, executive director. And Malik Bendelhum is, uh, inshallah, is going to introduce to you the, the executive, the majlis of the Shura Council. We have great brother Kareem Farooqi, mashallah, is working with the Shura Council and uh, helping Shura in its various programs and activities. Malik, mashallah, uh, is from this area. He has graduated with the Islamic Studies program in, uh, Imam, in uh, Imam Muhammad University, uh, Umar Qura University in Mecca, and uh, he has been very active in social work. He established what's called Sahaba Initiative, a charitable foundation doing a lot of charitable work in San Bernardino area and other areas. May Allah SWT bless him. So he is now at the helm of the affairs of the Shura Council and we thank him for that and pray to Allah SWT bless him. So Brother Malik will give you, uh, introduce you to other members of the Shura. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. The main thing that I really want to convey to each and every person here is that we as the Shura Council, as Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, we are the collective of all of the Masajid and the Muslim organizations here in Southern California. Our job and our goal and our hope is to bring all of the leadership and everyone, all of our organizations, our, our collective resources together, inshallah, so that we can move forward together. In this effort, alhamdulillah, we have a board that is comprised of the leadership of different um, organizations and communities. So I'd just like to quickly, inshallah, introduce each one of the, the ones that are here. Some of them aren't able to join us because of work and other engagements. But first, I'd actually like to recognize, of course, our chairman, Dr. Muzammin Siddiqui, who is here, alhamdulillah, as well as Dr. Ahmed Azam, who also serves on our majlis, on our board. Uh, we also have Dr. Ahmed Subuh, inshallah, who also serves on, on the board of our majlis, as well as Brother Owais Dadaboy, who is here. And we also have a few other majlis members who are unfortunately not able to be here with us. Uh, Sister Dua Luan, uh, Brother Arbaz Nizami, and then also uh, Brother Waqas Sayyid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of them, inshallah. I'd also like to call Brother Kaleem Farooqi, who is our development officer. Inshallah, if he can as well come up to the stage, inshallah. And the main reason why we want to do this, we want to make sure that all of you know who we are. That we are here to help, we are here to serve you, so now you see us, so we can't hide. You know who we are, any way that we can be of service, any way that we can help. We are here, please come see us. We have our booth right outside um, the hall right here on the right. If there's any way we can be of assistance with our prison outreach program, also our MSN program. We focus on inside public schools, but it's not limited to public schools, and it's not only limited to youth. We also have adults who do the presentations as well. We also have a new program coming up called the Young Inspirers, which is training youth leaders, giving them the tools to be able to function and to serve on boards of nonprofits uh, moving forward, inshallah, trying to equip our leadership with the tools to lead our community forward, inshallah. So we ask for your support, we ask for your dua. Jazakumullah khair, barakallahu feek, wassalamu alaikum. You know, this session is uh, with the partnership of the Shura, Shura Support Mass, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Dr. Muzzambil, and all the board members. And just a reminder before you continue, inshallah, in the uh, March 4th, the Shura have a banquet, and all of you invite, inshallah, since uh, we'll be March 4th. 2017. Now, shall we continue with the banners? Inshallah, um, introduce yourself, your take uh, as quick as possible. You can take the mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
Um, so I'll share with you a little bit on the international perspective of what the, what the state of the Muslim Ummah is, the global perspective. But to put things in, um, in picture for us, can, can I just have you, um, have us basically together reflect on, as a Muslim, um, how well or to what extent do you think your person is being represented in the global, global audience? How well, as a Muslim, do you feel that you are being represented in the global audience? And secondly, how well do you think your interests as a Muslim, as an Ummah, is being represented in the global audience? There's 7 billion people in the world, 1 billion of us are Muslims, that's about 15%. And allow me to share with you in my experience, um, I'm a youth ambassador, I work with the United Nations. I don't work for the United Nations, but I work with. I'm the director for a small little nonprofit. And we do development work, we advocate for international policies, we speak on behalf of civil society. And I'll share with you in my travels over a couple of years that the Muslim voice is not necessarily very well represented in those circles of power and those places of influence. We go to conferences, meetings, Muslims are on the agenda, we don't have Muslims um, on the panel. I promise you we have panels talking about Syria, talking about the Palestinian issue, and we don't have Muslims on those panels. Um, just to give you, to put things in perspective here, the UN Security Council, anybody heard about the UN Security Council? I hope you know what they do. They basically, um, th that, that is a part of the United Nations that is focused on um, basically security issues in the entire world. There are 15 members, five of those members are permanent. The United States, United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. Five years into the war in Syria, you don't have a solution because every resolution that goes to the Security Council is vetoed by either the US or Russia or China. Effectively, Syrians, the Muslims, were a pawn for the Cold War that is happening between the United States and Russia at this time. That's our representation. But not to spell doom for you, there's room to engage. Like I mentioned earlier on, um, I'm a director for a small little nonprofit, and we basically look at development policies of the United Nations, and we speak on behalf of civil society. How do these policies make sense? So for example, in the past, um, in the year 2000, there's a set of development policies that last 15 years, the Millennium Development Goals, and we worked on that. And the idea is in a post 9-11 world, we live in a post 9-11 world, the world can be divided now. After 9-11, everything basically changed, the status quo has changed. In a post 9-11 world, um, how can you have development policies that don't speak to religion, that don't speak to the realities of the conflict and the violence in the name of religion or political agenda that is masked under religious intolerance? How can we have a global development agenda that doesn't speak to that? And we basically travel the world campaigning, talking to people left and right, and what happened eventually now, a new set of agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, does speak to that. So we have a goal right now, a global development goal, that speaks to the realities of religiously motivated violence, violence in the name of religion, speaks to Islam, speaks to terrorism, speaks to political aims that mask themselves, I mean, I beg your pardon, political aims that manifest as religious intolerance, state-sponsored terrorism, things of that nature that we're very familiar with here. Just in closing, I'll share with you something from Gandhi. He said, first, they ignore you. Then they mock you, then you win. We need to engage. So first of all, Muslims are not being, they ignore us. Now we're being mocked. But the beautiful thing about us being mocked is that when they mock you, they listen to you. I mean, you can't mock somebody in their absence almost, I mean. But when they mock you, you have the audience. We have the audience now of the entire world. And the next step is that we win. This is in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he started his message. Nobody listened to him. For the most part, the large Meccan population didn't listen to him. And then they ignored him. They called him a sasra, a liar, X, Y, Z. And then, inna fatahna la kafata mubina, Allah opened Mecca for him. Allah brought him victory from places he knew not. If somebody told him in the beginning that you will be ruling the entire world, that the Muslim, um, that's the Muslim population, I think about the Muslim Ummah that will come after you, will basically rule the entire world, he would have denied that. They ignored him, they mocked him, and then he was the one that was victorious. Jazakallah khair.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I feel very humbled uh, being here, uh, uh, sharing what I have to share with you today as, uh, as a Muslim, as a professional. Um, I have a PhD in Spanish linguistics from UCLA. Uh, I remember asking myself the question as a researcher, uh, why is it that uh, in Spain today uh, you have all these languages spoken, uh, Catalan, Gallego, Asturiano, Leones, besides Castilian, which is Spanish, and Arabic that was spoken for 800, 900 years, died. So I started a quest of language death, and I did not realize what I was going to find. So I, um, from a perspective of uh, historian, linguist, I started looking at uh, what happened, what was that Spanish experience, a Muslim Spanish experience. And to call it even a Spanish experience is wrong, it's the Iberian Peninsula, so it's Spanish and Portuguese. So looking at Spanish and Portuguese and seeing how the Iberian Peninsula has been Arabized, then Islamized, and then de-Arabized and de-Islamized. So I went through the entire process. Uh, some specifically Muslim researchers uh, in the field, historians, have uh, said, why would you do something so sad? You know, this is a very sad topic. We already know we lost Al-Andalus, it's an over story. This is not something we want to look at. If you want to look at it, look at the peak moments. Let's look at when Muslims contributed something in science and astronomy and the good days. You know, why are we looking at the bad days? We don't want to see that side. Let's just say 1492, Granada fell, Muslims lost it, it's over, end of story. Well, my research begins with the end of story. So I decided to look at what happened in the, la in the last 500 years only. So before that, we had a Muslim experience in Spain, and only in the last 500 years that the voice of Muslims have been silenced. So I don't know why for some reason Allah chose me to be the person to put voice to these people who had no voice. And I began the quest through documents, historical, primary sources, looking at what is left, what could I find of these people. Is it possible that really after 1492, everybody packed their bags and left? So everybody became refugees somewhere? Is that the scenario? Did just people really convert to Christianity and all Muslims are gone? Or what's going on? What happened in that scenario? What happened to that story? So in that quest, I came across documents written during Spanish Inquisition. And what's amazing about this is that I did not realize that it took 354 years to undo Islam. 354 years of work after the fall of 1492 to get people just to um, be de-Islamized, if you wish. <laughs> so in that process, looking at it, I said, okay, this is either going to be a very sad story or I'm going to have to see something positive here. And it's amazing how when you see um, the resilience is number one. Number two is the perseverance in faith. I mean, I guess it prevails even if people choose to camouflage it, hide it, cover it up. And then last but not least is what can I do today? How can I turn this into something today? So I was looking around me and I see people that there's zero effort being done coming to Islam who speak Spanish. And I used to say to myself, SubhanAllah, that is amazing that Spanish speakers are finding Islam after 500 years of losing it. So this is really amazing. This is coming for circle for me. What can the sadness turn into other than make it be part of work? Well, if you don't turn it into something positive, energetic, then you are gonna sit down with a story that's sad. Oh wow, this is lost and woe to us that we, I guess, you know, screwed up and we can't rewrite the past. So how can we learn from that past and move on to today and tomorrow? Because that rewriting it or restructuring it or redesigning it to come out with a different outcome is not happening. And I tried to do that for a while. It's like, if we didn't do that, then this wouldn't happen. And I realized from that if scenario that this is just the scenario that takes you nowhere. So how about what can I do today and what can we do today? So uh, in a very organic way, 
uh, this developed into Mass in Español that we have today. And a year ago, when I approached uh, Mass and I came up to them and I said, what is happening for Spanish speakers? How come we don't have presentations for people who speak Spanish and they have, they need the language, there's a language barrier, there's a cultural barrier, what can we do to uh, promote Islam to in, in that arena? Given that we are in a predominantly Spanish speaking context, I mean, we can forget the context and pretend we are, this is just an English speaking context, or we could be realistic and realize that more than half of the population around us are Spanish speakers. So if we take the context as part of reality, then there has to be something done to address. So on a very mini basis, or baby steps if you wish, we were doing it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Who needs the Spanish Quran? Who needs a flyer? Who needs information? Uh, someone is converting here, someone, and it became, who can take my hand? Who can, you know, escort me through the process? I am actually, hello, I'm Muslim, beyond the takbir, can you do something with me? Can you educate me? Can you teach me? So there has to be this, there was a void that we had to fill. So it really, it came up with, in a very organic way, a program or, um, so I, I can't take credit for something that really is a group effort. This is a teamwork, it, amazing sisters that are not here in this session, would love to be here, they're in the Spanish session. Sister Ana, Somaya, Lucy, Magdalena, Maria, uh, people who really have made this this happen on the one-on-one -on -one level, on the community level, on, and I am here their voice to say that we need support, we need to do this on a bigger level, and from a history perspective, I am saying this is coming full circle. This is the, these are somehow linked to their ancestors that were completely cut off for 500 years. So maybe there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe this is not exactly a bleak story and maybe this can actually turn into a very positive thing. Uh, we have so, Spanish-speaking world from Mexico to Argentina. There's a lot of work on the, the local, national, and, and international level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. I think we have round two as well for this, inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My name is Hussam Ayloush and I'm the executive director of CARE. I do a lot of civil rights work or education, educating about Islam uh, in Southern California, but I also wear different hats. I'm uh, also the national chair of the Syrian American Council, an organization focusing on promoting uh, democracy and human rights and freedom in Syria. So keep your brothers and sisters in Syria in your prayers and the dua. Uh, I also uh, serve on the executive board of the California Democratic Party uh, as, as, as a political activist. My passion is, is human rights, especially in Muslim majority countries. This is where I feel there is the most need for us to focus, as I do a lot of the civil rights work here in, in Southern California and nationally. And uh, to comment quickly on the state of affairs of the Ummah, I can say maybe it's in, in one word, it's hor hor horrible. It's, it's, it's really uh, dire. The situation of the Ummah, probably the Ummah in general has not seen worse days than the ones we are witnessing now, to put it lightly. And I, I, I hate to share bad news. I mean, this is, this is what it is. I can't sugarcoat it. Uh, despite the fact that the Ummah is, is alhamdulillah, still filled with every, every factor and every ingredient and every requirement to be actually successful and, and a leader in promoting justice for all people in the world. But it, it has been tested with corrupt leaders, uh, leaders who don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't fear their, uh, don't recognize their responsibility. Uh, you know, a lot of lack of education, illiteracy, ignorance, tribalism, sectarianism, divisions, that exists in the Muslim Ummah that has allowed for that to get worse in terms of the state of affairs of the Ummah. So just quickly what I would suggest for us, uh, we have time to go over a few maybe highlights and inshallah will elaborate if time permits in the Q&A. First of all, my, my advice to all of us is to not be shy to say we belong to an Ummah. I know there's a tendency to say, alhamdulillah, we are American Muslims and we're proud of being American Muslims and that is great. Uh, we, we are sub-identities all the time. We are many identities all the time. You can be Egyptian American, Muslim, Arab, Syrian, uh, African American, Hispanic, uh, 
whatever other identities you might have, age, uh, interest, political interest, but also you're a Muslim. And you're a Muslim who belongs to an Ummah. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Right? We're all an Ummah that, that, that bonds us, this brotherhood and sisterhood in Islam. So don't be ashamed, don't feel that in order to prove my other identities, I have to give up one. In order to prove that I am an American, I have to give up the fact that I am a Muslim. Also, don't be shy to or afraid uh, to stand up for causes that are unpopular nowadays. Uh, you know, it might be popular to speak up for justice in one place, but it might not be that popular to speak about Palestine, for example. Uh, don't be shy or afraid to stand up for what is right. When you know what is right, that's your responsibility to address. And we can elaborate a little bit more in details. Also, quick advice is to stand for principles and values. Stand for what is right, not for nationalism. Don't stand for tribalism. Don't stand for sectarianism. Don't defend your sect, your tribe, your nationality, your race, just because you blindly think you should follow that. Stand for what is right. And sometimes that means you might be critical of Muslims. You might be critical of people who might be part of your circle because you're standing for what is right, for justice, for freedom, for truth. Also be very familiar with the causes. I know there are certain causes we're very familiar with, we know them, Syria, Palestine, Iraq maybe, but uh, for those of us who are not from, uh, from, from, from Southeast Asia, we need to know what is happening in Kashmir. We need to know what is happening to the Uyghur Muslims, millions of Muslims in China who are denied basic human rights. We need to know about the Rohingya Muslims in Burma. We need to know about Muslims who are suffering in Nigeria. We need to know about all these cases because that's part of our Ummah in Bangladesh, in India, in Gujarat, in many places around the world, because the only way we can be part of the solution is if we know the problem. No one is expected to become a specialized person on all these matters, but be familiar. It wouldn't take you a lot of time to read a little bit, talk to people from that region, so you can be equipped to help with it. Uh, last but not least, uh, and we'll elaborate inshallah if time permits, how can we help? We can best help and we are probably the best positioned Muslims in the world to help. We are in America where we can organize. We have the resources, the knowledge, the diversity that allows us inshallah to speak out of nationalism but based on principles. And we can elaborate how we as American Muslims can inshallah make that difference. Zakhim Lakhir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Hisham Abdullah. Uh, Dr. Ahmed asked me to uh, introduce myself and talk a little bit about my passion and my take on the status of the Muslim Ummah, at least a small piece of it that I can see. Um, the, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a product of mass. I mean, this when, when people ask me to introduce myself, I'm a product of mass in, in almost everything that I stand for and everything that I try to do professionally as well as in the, in, in, the, in the field of da'wah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me to do. Uh, my passion from a professional point of view is uh, developing new medicines, you know, new drugs for debilitating conditions, for very severe illnesses. Uh, work with, with uh, you know, teams of, of great people who are trying to help these patients, inshallah, to achieve better health. That's professional. Um, from, from a da'wah point of view, um, I, I've been a, a witness of a part of the Amer American Muslim experience for the past uh, 32 years to be exact, and have been a, a observing, you know, what is, wh where, where are we going, you know, as, as, as American Muslims? How are we serving the cause of Islam in this country? How? And, and I have focused in, you know, I know my great brothers and sisters are focusing on the situation of the Ummah as a whole, of the situation of the, of the American Muslim community as a whole. What I'm trying to focus on with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables me to do is to focus on those who are interested in working for Islam and those who are interested in serving the cause of Islam. And then I've, I've noticed that there are, these are two groups, you know, there are people who, who love to, who like, like the, the sponges, they love to acquire knowledge and they love to, to, to learn more and, and to, to, to read and, and attend uh, um, you know, courses and so on and acquire more knowledge. And on the other hand, there are people who are so active, but unfortunately in being so active, they are quote unquote too busy to, to acquire knowledge. 
And that creates a great imbalance. You have those people who are, you know, sitting and, and observing and learning and, and making comments and criticizing sometimes and so on. And you have the other group of people who are working and spending effort, but Yani subhanallah, in some cases, and I'm not shy to say it, like Imam Hassan al-Basri radiallahu anhu said that the, the person who, uh, who is working without knowledge is like a traveler who doesn't have a map, who's just going just wherever he goes. And he also said that a person who works without knowledge causes more harm than good. And we really need to, to focus on this. So my, my passion from a, a da'wah point of view is trying to, to, to work on the American Muslim worker's mind. Trying to reformat, if you will, this mind based on, on very sound principles of understanding of our, of our beautiful deen. As it was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu as was understood by the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, and as was practiced by the best generations of Muslims. And that's the, what, once we do that, inshallah, everything else will fall into place in terms of setting our priorities straight, in terms of not like, you know, sweating the small things and wasting our effort and spinning our wheels and wasting our time in, in useless arguments, for example. An effort is to actually focus on what really matters and what really makes a difference. Assalamualaikum everyone, my name is Yasmin Azab. Um, so I am definitely not um, as accomplished or as qualified to be up here, but I think my biggest accomplishment would be being Dr. Ahmed Azam's daughter and uh, Sister Asma Al-Qur's daughter. So, all right, next. Um, so this is for them. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, I would, I think that the question uh, for kind of describing the state of the Ummah uh, can be approached in several different ways. You can approach it through the spiritual lens, social lens, political lens. Um, but I think that ultimately it comes down to, at least in, in, my, in my opinion, um, Muslims trying to um, express and articulate ourselves in a way that is reflective of our understanding of Islam and what Allah SWT expects from us as Muslims while also trying to navigate through uh, what others think Islam and what Muslims uh, what Muslims are or look like or should act like and that kind of thing. So I think it's really ultimately about trying to reconcile as Muslims between what we believe with conviction is our Islamic identity and is actually an, an exhibition of our Muslimness while also trying to kind of react and respond to all these accusations and misunderstandings of what um, Islam and Muslims are. Um, so, and I think that does manifest in the political realm, in the social realm, and also internally in the spiritual realm. Can we give a big round of applause to my dear sister Yasmin once more? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulahi kareem. My name is Shaquille Sayyid. Uh, um, I uh, am the person who uh, Dr. Siddiqui has graciously um, uh, briefly introduced earlier. I served as the Executive Director of Islamic Shura Council for some time. And uh, this is the most peaceful transition in the Ummah today where I step down and my dear brother Malik Bendel, whom, uh, if he's around here, uh, he became the director of Shura Council. So this is unlike the transition that we all are subjected to in this country today. And may Allah bless uh, Shura Council, may Allah bless brother Malik Bendel, whom to, uh, uh, to uh, enrich uh, Shura Council in many ways under the leadership of the Majlis and the chairperson, inshallah. Um, I currently serve uh, an organization by the name Orange County Communities Organized for Responsible Development. Its acronym is ACCORD. Uh, it's an uh, affiliate of a national network of organizations whose primary mandate is to advocate for just and fair economic policies for the working class people who is decimated in our nation. Uh, that's broadly is my work. 
I work primarily with the um, non-Muslim community, but as a proud Muslim, uh, sharing my values and my ethics and my principles with uh, the community that I currently serve in all of Orange County, uh, irrespective of faith and uh, background people. That's my passion. My passion has, uh, is to be of some service to others instead of always on the receiving end. Um, in the interest of time, I, I, it, it would be difficult for me, I guess, to discuss about the state of the Ummah and so on, but I will say that in one word. The state of the Ummah is, despite of all that has been happening and the Ummah is subjected to, this is the single most resilient community that perhaps we have known in our lifetime and maybe even beyond. And we thank Allah for that, for that conviction and commitment to our principles and values in spite and despite of all that they have been subjected to that Brother Hussam uh, has referred to in various geographic parts. Uh, I think uh, we have this absolute luxury today on 27th of November in 2016 sitting in the comforts of this hall to debate about the state of the Ummah while there are people who are literally carrying their little babies in their hands and arms and trying to find a refuge for themselves. Which is to say that you and I have an extremely important responsibility on our shoulders to th not only think of and discuss and debate, but also find our place in alleviating the sufferings of our people. Jazakumullah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. My name is uh, Jihad Safir, and currently I'm the director of the Isla LA campus. Alhamdulillah. And um, we have, uh, you know, thus far we have a school, um, and we do social services. So we have a full time Islamic um, elementary, junior high school, and also pre-K and kindergarten um, school, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, you know, and we're going on our third, well this is uh, our third year, alhamdulillah. So I'm the director of that particular project, uh, which is called Isla Academy. And then also we do social services, we do prison uh, re-entry. Uh, we also have uh, a food pantry that we run every, every Saturday. And um, of course we have um, the religious side, which is Masjid Ibadullah. So uh, I'm the son of one of the uh, you know, pioneers of the Southern California uh, Muslim community, Imam Sadiq Safir, alhamdulillah, which he, he's not here, but uh, he doesn't have to be here. He's done enough work, and alhamdulillah, him giving advice and being able to relax, I'm pretty much assigned to that. I have to make sure that he's doing okay. And as long as he's okay, if all of his needs are meet, met, then I think I'm doing okay. So as long as his needs, he's put in work, and we have to look at, uh, from Dr. Muzammil to, to those who came before us, alhamdulillah, if they're doing okay, alhamdulillah, we're doing okay. And as far as my passion is concerned, so uh, I'm currently doing doctoral work in the area of, you know, what they would term practical theology. Uh, essentially, it's removing religion or the explanation of religion from the clouds and bringing it to the people. So my concern right now is, you know, when I see a young man or a young sister caught up in the streets, perhaps gangbanging, I have to figure out how to bring Islam to them. And then also I have to figure out how to bring Islam to the South Los Angeles community. The thing I want to share with you all, why I see that also as my passion, because I'm around people who don't have much. 
but they appreciate so little, and I learned so much from them. I learned so much from the woman who comes every Saturday to collect food from our food pantry, who gives me advice on my relationship, tells me to be a good person. She doesn't have much. I learned so much from, I served as a chaplain for three years in a state prison, a woman's state prison. I learned so much, I called the ladies in that prison my aunties. They taught me so much. They taught me how to appreciate what I have. I learned so much from the people who, they come to my community despite the trials, the tribulations that they're going through from their home, growing up without a father. I learned so much from the young man who never met his father, who tells me to appreciate my father because I see my father every day. I learned so much from the woman who, her mother was on drugs, strung out on crack cocaine, and she tells me to appreciate my mother and I say all of this to say that as a Muslim community, yes, we have our trials and tribulations. It can always be worse. It can always be much worse. We are in a very beautiful position. I don't care if Donald Trump is in office. I appreciate the people who I'm around. I appreciate the individuals who I'm allowed to sit up here with. And I'm not going to escape my reality. There are those who have tried to escape. You have the example of Yunus, alayhi salam, and we learn from his story. He escaped only to find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned his community around the concept of al ibaq this escapism. We have the state of the ummah we can talk about all day. The state of the ummah is the state of the ummah. It is what it is. But we have a very beautiful opportunity in this day and time. Do not escape this opportunity. Advice, don't try to escape your truth, your reality. Deal with it, it is what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. And secondly, from my experience, which I learned, it took me a while to learn this. Go to the people who are struggling, who are also struggling. You'll find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with those people. You'll find Allah with the people who are struggling. And there are plenty of people who are struggling more than us. Find those people, go to those people, see how you can serve those people. And third, just learn to smile. Nothing wrong with smiling and learn to laugh. We are in beautiful times. Yes, there are some trials that we're experiencing, but these trials are not going to stop me from smiling and serving those who are in need. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, you took half of the time for the introduction. Let's have the second half for the conclusion. Uh, I think smiling is good, and all of you smiling. However, I want to uh, back, go back to Brother Hassan Malouch when he do want to sugarcoat things. The, probably you know many of our youth as of today, they are struggling with their identity. Many of the youth, they are trying to escape, and some of them already escaped. Yesterday, one of the presentation, the speaker said, you know, somebody changed his name from Muhammad to Mo, and he said, I support him. I said, because Muhammad needs somebody like Muhammad to carry the name. If you cannot be as good as Muhammad or follow brother, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, then we need somebody else to, um, to be like Muhammad. So I want to ask all of you, what's your advice for the passive youth, for those who are walking away from presenting Islam or to appear like Muslims? For many of our youth who are not even joining the conferences. So if any advice, Mr. Brother Hussam, because you don't want to sugar with anything, probably would be a great idea to start with this question. 
I think it's important to realize we will never be able to get everybody involved. So if we start with that assumption, it makes it easier by lowering the expectation. Even during the time of Prophet Muhammad, and that's the best of times, there were people at different levels, the strong Sahabas, weak Sahabas, and there were hypocrites. So the reality is, let's, let's start by focusing on the ones who are looking for, some, for, for ways to, to help. These are the ones who complain, they want to help, but they're not finding spaces at the masajid and the organizations. So before we try to recruit others, let's help engage those who are asking to be recruited. Uh, one way we can do it is for our organization to be become to become a little bit more inclusive. Our massage. I mean, I would suggest I've been suggesting that to all the massage to have one or two or three positions designated for youth, for people under 25 year old. To say there will always be people. A board of organizations. And mashallah, Mass takes a, 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 the lead in, in that. All of us can learn from that, and in including the youth at the leadership position, not just at the volunteers position. Uh, the same way. As a community, as a Muslim community, we have failed miserably in supporting our young people in activism. For example, we look at all other communities. Look at the Jewish community, look at the Latino community, look at others. They've invested a lot of money in, uh, for example, the, their student uh, organizations. Much of the student activism for the Jewish community on campus is actually funded by the Jewish community. We haven't spent that much. Our MSA, for example, they have to struggle to do the little fundraising, selling, selling some lemonade and cookies, and maybe tapping into some funding from the university to do their activism. Imagine if we, as Masajid now, invest, if every masjid, as we have a religious director, maybe an assistant imam, we have a youth director, a youth director, and there are few Masajid that do that already, but not enough, considering we have 80 masjids, we should have 80 youth directors here. Imagine if Shura Council is funded, given enough funds to hire a, a youth development department that focuses specifically on the MSAs, providing them spiritual help, providing them uh, programs directors that will help them with programs. That will automatically triple, probably multiply the number of active youth by 10. And then they can extend the circle to others, inshallah. <laughs> And I think when I take this opportunity to say, uh, even Mass, inshallah, in the future, we try, we have so much need for the youth help and development. Hopefully, inshallah, Mass soon will hire a, a youth director as well to help with the, with the need of the youth as, as well to contribute with the solution. Uh,